Hi, I'm Sterling Edwards. Thank you for joining me. Let's spend, spend a few minutes talking about charging color and glazing color. These are the two terms you read about a lot in books. You hear about it in DVDs. And sometimes you're not really familiar with what the, what the term means. Other times, maybe you know what it is, but you're not sure when to use it. So we're going to spend a few minutes looking at this and look at the differences. They're both uh, very interesting techniques where you can layer colors on top of other colors or infuse other colors together on wet paper. Either one works well fine. It depends on what kind of effect you want. Now, if you look, at, look down at my paper very quickly, I've got a piece of 140-pound Fabriano Artistico cold-pressed paper taped down. It's a very small piece, about an eighth of a sheet. And as you can see, I've taken uh, a pencil and drawn two trees. They're, the trees are identical. One I took the liberty of painting with uh, brown steel to grain, which is one of the primary blue colors. It's a very, very clean, transparent brown. Now, when you talk about glazing color and charging color, uh, I'm a transparent watercolorist. I've been, I've been doing that for years. These same things work with opaque, but I truly believe they work better with transparent watercolors because it allows the light to pass through the paint, strike the white paper, and bounce back, picking up the various colors that you either glazed or charged into your existing shapes. So what's the difference between a charged color and a glazed color? If you look at this tree where I took the liberty of painting it uh, with the brown steel to grain, it's very, very flat. The, the tree has no dimension. It's just a very flat brown shape. If I want to put more color on that when it's dry, that's called glazing color. Glazing color essentially is laying a color on top of dry color. You can do three or four colors if you want to. And if you're using transparent paint, it almost gives the effect of looking through multiple layers of stained glass. Uh, for example, if you lay a piece of blue stained glass on top of a piece of yellow stained glass, it creates a third color, which is green. Well, that's what glazing color does. I can, for example, come on part of this tree and put a, a very, very light, thin, watery wash of violet, for example, and you'll still see parts of the brown, you'll see parts of the violet. Where the two colors overlap, you'll see a third color, which should be more of a kind of a muted gray color. Let's take a look and see how it works. Let's take some permanent violet bluish. This is a very clean, very transparent violet. I'm making a, mixing a nice watery mix of it. And I really do, when I'm charging, uh, glazing color, I really do think of this as layering stained glass. So I've got to be very specific where I put the color. Since this is dry, it's going to stay exactly where I put it. It's not going to flow and run. Now I can always take a wet brush and kind of move it around to get some soft edges if I choose to. In fact, for this demonstration, I think I will. Let's just have another brush damp. This is a one inch flat brush. It's damp and I've squeezed most of the water out of it. And let's see if we can put some color on this brown tree using this very transparent wash of permanent violet bluish. Let's see what happens. Let's have a few shadows coming across the tree. For example, maybe the light is coming in like this and there's a lot of branches casting shadows. Now I can take the damp brush and very lightly soften that. Now here's a key to make color glazing really stand out and make it work quite well. When you glaze color on an existing dry color, don't go back and forth too many times. When you put that wet brush on that brown shape, you're reactivating that brown paint. And if you start brushing back and forth too many times, that wet brown paint is gonna mix with that violet paint and you get one flat color. The idea is to put it on one or two brush strokes and then get out and leave it alone. Let it dry or take a dryer and dry it. It's a very beautiful effect. And if you can look at this piece, you'll see now this tree has all kinds of beautiful uh, subtle shading on it, uh, textures on it. For example, suggesting some uh, maybe branches up here casting shadows down across the trunk. And you see just a good variety of grayish and violet colors in addition to the brown. That's a classic example of a glazed color. A wet paint on a dry paint done very quickly, allowing the two to interact and let the transparency of the color kind of, uh, you know, create a third color for you. So that should help you a little bit with glazed colors. Now, one time I, a lot of times when I use glazed colors, if I'm painting a building, for example, maybe I'm painting a barn, and part of the barn has sunlight hitting it, the other part doesn't. It's more or less in the shade. Rather than just having a brown side on that barn, while that paint, after that first uh, gray or brown side of the paint is dry, I can come back and glaze a little bit of blue, a little bit of violet, a little bit of golden lake, which is very similar to quinacridone gold. And suddenly a very flat shape in my painting now is very vibrant, has a lot of color in it. 
but it's still grayed down enough that it looks like it's out of the sunlight. Whereas the side of the barn, for example, that's facing the sun, looks much brighter because I left that area predominantly white. Glazing color is a, is a wonderful technique. I use it a lot in my paintings. And I also use charging color. Now, the difference between charging color and glazing, quite simply, is this. Charging color means you're putting a wet paint into an existing wet paint, allowing the two to kind of diffuse and blend naturally on the paper. The more I paint, the more I believe in charging color. In fact, everything I paint nowadays, uh, I make it a point, while the shape is still wet, to take a brush and just drop a few other colors into it, at least one or two, because you get these very subtle nuances of color. Sometimes they're so subtle you don't notice them at first, but when the painting dries and you look at these darker shapes, you start seeing these little warm areas peeking out or these cool areas peeking out, and these secondary colors and even these third layers of colors start becoming very present. And it's a beautiful technique. When placed under glass, the, the shape, which might have been you know, predominantly flat or monochromatic, now has lots of color variety and lots of interest. Let's take this tree right here, which is identical to this one, and let's paint this with that same brown color we started out with on this, only this time, while the shape is still wet, we're going to charge some of the violet into it. And we might even charge a third color into it as well. So let's try it and see what happens. Let's take some more of the still to grain brown. Still to grain brown is a very clean, very transparent brown. I'm just using a one inch flat brush. This is a great uh, exercise to try. Take some of those paintings that you uh, are not that pleased with. We all have them. We all have piles of them. Pull them out, use the back of them, and practice this. Or even take some of the shapes in the painting you have and try doing some, uh, some glazing on some of the shapes you have and just see what you can do. So I'm trying to work fairly fast and catch this while it's still wet. And here's that long branch coming out from the side. Now, let's take that same wet violet. This time I'm catching this while it's wet. And let's just very quickly drop it in. And you notice I'm not brushing it. I'm, I'm literally dropping it. Just hitting the paper, letting the paint kind of roll off the brush into that existing brown shape. It's a very, very subtle effect. But what it's going to do when this dries the paints will diffuse naturally. You get this nice uh, gradation of color from the warm brown over into the cool violet with a nice clean soft edge. Over here, if you look at this piece, the edges are much harder. That's because that was done on dry paper. This has a much softer look and since it was done on wetter paper. And just for fun, let's put one more color into it. Let's take a little bit of cupric green. Cupric green is a very rich kind of a blue green. It's almost like a viridian. Let's put one more color and again, just Drop it in lightly. Don't, don't get overzealous with that brush. You don't need to. The, the wet paper is going to do 90% of the work for you. Just drop it in a few places and see what happens. Now we're going to take a dryer and dry this. And I want you to look at just the variety of color you have in this one shape when you come back and you start charging color into it. It's a beautiful effect. I'll be right back. Let me dry this very quickly. Okay, we're back. I took a few minutes to get my hair dryer out and totally dry both shapes, make sure they're completely dry so we can look at the end result. If you look at this one where I glaze the color, you do see the hard lines, like I say, because this glazed color was put on a dry shape, so the paint stays right where I put it. And I could always soften it a little bit with a damn brush if I wanted to, just to get a variety of hard edges and soft edges. This one, however, if you look at it, if you look at it, there's very, very subtle modeling all through the piece. Uh, the green hits the violet, turns into kind of a blue violet, and then you got these beautiful browns, and it just has a much softer look to it. So you're working on a painting, and you've got this shape that's wet. You've got to make a decision. Do I want to charge the color while it's still wet and go for this look, which is these very subtle little back, backdrops of color, or do I want to wait till the piece is totally dry and then come in and glaze some color on top of it, or perhaps I can do both. There's no reason why you can't go ahead while the shape is wet and charge some color into it, then after it dries, you can still come back and glaze some more color on top of it. This is what makes transparent watercolor so fascinating. By, by just using two or three colors and a little creative brushwork, uh, we can just create a multitude of colors in this shape. All that's left now to finish these trees is just a couple little suggestions of some bark or detail. I'm just using a number six rigger brush, brush and just popping a little, little texture into them. And we got a couple of trees that are 
just very, very clean expressions of a tree using transparent watercolor. I hope you enjoy this. Practice this a few times. It's actually fun. And from now on, when you're working on a piece and you've got a nice wet shape, ask yourself before it dries, would this not be a good chance to charge some color into it? Thank you for joining me.